would have found that that must be the answer. The only question that science can address is not whether there is a purposeless means of creation, because purpose could come into existence only when it had evolved by purposeless means. All that science can address is the question of, granted that we are here as a result of purposeless material mechanisms, what's the most plausible purposeless material mechanism that we can imagine? And in that case, the answer will be the force that produced those variations in the population of light and dark peppered moths. Because that's what we can observe happening. It must be the same sort of thing writ large that produced moths and trees and scientific observers in the first place. And if the skeptic says, well, I'm not satisfied, I want to know how do you know that, the answer will be, what is your alternative? We have given you a scientific answer. It is an answer which is scientific because it re rests only on things that we can observe, extending their effects enormously to be sure, uh, but at least we can observe them doing a little bit. And if you don't like that answer, what better answer can you provide? You cannot answer that question by saying, I believe that a creator did the creating, because the skeptic will be told, that's a subject outside of science. We've already told you how we define science. Weren't you listening? We told you that science assumes that we are here as a result of purposeless material processes. So that is strike one. And if you say, well, how about the answer, we don't know, the skeptic will be told that isn't acceptable under the rules of science either. You don't know how science works because we have given you a scientific answer. If you don't like the answer, you're free to try to improve on it, but science does not operate by discarding what is already known and going right back to the beginning and saying, we don't know anything, we give up. We're going to turn it over to the priests or the metaphysicians uh, or the television commentators or something like that. Science stays with the answer it has, and no matter how many difficulties that answer is encountering, until or unless a better answer, which is fully naturalistic, um, and involves no creator, supernatural power, or whatever, is produced. So the skeptic finds um, that in the attempt to ask the critical question, is the blind watchmaker th thesis true, uh, he has been met with a series of philosophical barricades that make that question practically impossible to ask in a university or scientific forum. Now, the conclu what conclusion does the skeptic come to uh, from all of this encounter? Of course, what I'm describing to you is the encounter that I have had over the years with my um, uh, many uh, 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 colleagues and uh, uh, debating adversaries and whatnot who have come from the camp of Darwinian belief. Well, it seems to the skeptic to be fairly clear what has happened that what has happened is this, um, is that science of a certain kind desperately wants to answer uh, from its own resources the question, how did we come to be here? In order to answer that question, it has to make certain very far-reaching and controversial assumptions and then to protect those assumptions. And what has happened is this. Um, that in the 19th century, uh, scientists became aware of a way in which they could explain how certain small-scale changes occur in beings which are already in existence. Uh, this was the original version of the Darwinian theory of evolution. Uh, Charles Darwin advanced this theory to challenge the position that he stated as the alternative that the species are immutable. That is, that every species today is exactly the way it has always been in the past. Now, he was able to show with some success, uh, with a great deal of success, 
that that straw man proposition is not true. That is to say that there has been variation and change in the kinds of living creatures that exist, that they have changed somewhat, just as those island species change over time, that they are modified uh, uh, somewhat from what they were before. Uh, moreover, a science was able to show, and quite convincingly, um, that there are diff that different kinds of beings have lived on the Earth at different times. The fossils record many species, and many types of creatures, such as the dinosaurs, um, that existed in the past and that do not exist today. Uh, some of the creatures that exist today appear only late in the geological column, or relatively later than other creatures. So there seems to have been some change in the kinds of living things that lived on the Earth at different times. Armed with that information, uh, an adventurous band of scientists said, well, why don't we posit that the same force that produces these minor changes that shows change in the species uh, could be responsible uh, for all of the work of creation, uh, from the very simplest uh, first being all the way to the present, and treat that um, as our starting point for further research, and accept that as an explanation for everything that has happened. And the explanation was so satisfying to the scientific mind. It was so, um, uh, it seemed to explain so much if it were true, that it became very dear and very cherished. Um, and indeed, it changed the world. Um, it enabled scientists to become uh, the most important cultural authorities uh, of their society, uh, replacing the, the uh, uh, clergy, um, and um, uh, it had enormous consequences for the way uh, people came to see themselves, and eventually it became to be a fundamental truth and doctrine to be cherished and protected uh, rather than a mere hypothesis to be tested against the evidence. Um, and so, uh, by this process of extrapolation, a solution to a very minor part of the history of life uh, became accepted and protected as the story of all creation. Um, and even now, when it is clear um, to a great many skeptics within the scientific world uh, that the evidence does not support uh, the claim uh, that life evolved in a series of tiny step by tiny step increments, as the theory um, uh, 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 says, um, the theory has been protected uh, by that all-purpose philosophical response, what is your alternative? Now that's what, the way the skeptic thinks. Um, and as, as uh, some of you probably know from having read the book, perhaps from having read some of the many reviews that have been come about, come about there's been a, a tremendous amount of debate about all of those propositions in the skeptical uh, case. Most of that debate has centered upon the philosophical issues uh, rather than on the accuracy of any particular piece of scientific uh, information. Um, and um, there is uh, no great mystery in my mind as to why that is the case. Um, there is, in fact, as, as so much information which is tremendously difficult to reconcile with the Darwinian paradigm that many of the most eminent authorities who have supported that paradigm uh, from time to time um, uh, have, in fact, acknowledged uh, the existence of a fossil, a fossil record, for example, which is tremendously difficult uh, to reconcile with Darwinian expectations. My formidable adversary, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, even described in one of his papers the Darwinian theory as effectively dead, and then came back later to defend it, uh, precisely because he realized that there was no alternative, um, and that to abandon the Darwinian theory was to abandon for the moment the claim that science has solved the mystery of how we got here. Uh, but there's been a tremendous amount of controversy over the book, and now that I've given you a picture of the skeptic think, I want to tell you about how a couple of very prominent critics have reacted to the skeptic's argument and to the argument of the book. Uh, one of those critics is not a biologist, it's a great physicist, uh, Steven Weinberg, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, uh, who is uh, the principal author of the electroweak theory, uh, which is uh, a first step uh, towards the dream of a grand unified theory that will unite all of the forces of uh, physics into a grand synthesis 
um, and be the greatest scientific accomplishment of all time. Um, this um, is the dream which is discussed in a book that probably many of you have seen, either the book or the movie that was made of the book, uh, Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time. It's been the subject of many other books with titles like The Theory of Everything, The Mind of God, The God Particle, or in Stephen Weinsberg's case, Dreams of a Final Theory. Um, and uh, uh, I bring a physicist into this to show you how because I think it's tremendously instructive to show you how a great scientific intellect and one of the real rulers of science of our time uh, looks at the challenge to the Darwinian paradigm uh, from his perspective. Um, because Weinberg uh, uh, has just come out with a book for the general reader, quite a good book, uh, uh, called Dreams of a Final Theory, and he does me the honor of taking several pages in uh, uh, the book's uh, 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 next to last chapter to discuss my challenge to Darwinism. Um, in fact, he uh, does me the honor to call me the most respectable academic critic of evolution today, um, a title which I would take great pride in if I were not aware that Professor Weinberg has an extremely low opinion of all of the other critics of uh, <laughs> evolution. So that it's a little bit like being the sanest person in the uh, insane asylum or uh, the most honest man in state prison or something like that. But um, I'll take these honors where I can get them without looking too carefully at the, the implications. Um, now, uh, one of the interesting things about Professor Weinberg's critique of Johnson's critique of the neo-Darwinian synthesis is that he was able to refute me without ever once looking at the book. Um, uh, that is to say, as far as one can tell from the book itself um, uh, and the reference notes to it, he relied entirely on an article I had written for First Things uh, magazine um, and had not bothered to look up the evidence in the book. He tells me that he has since looked at it and, uh, well, when we had a discussion of this in uh, Texas, but that doesn't appear from the book. Um, and he didn't have to, in part because he's a particle physicist and so far above biologists in standing, um, that he doesn't really need uh, uh, to look at um, the details of the evidence, but, in, but mainly because it is a, it, he can tell that I must be wrong because I do not think as the scientific enterprise requires one to think. And that's really the point I want to emphasize to you today as I describe to you how a physicist a, uh, who is a scientific reductionist reacts to a, a criticism of um, uh, Darwinian theory. And his response is essentially to say, so Johnson has shown that the neo-Darwinian theory is against the evidence at various points. So what? Essentially the answer is so what? He says, in, in making that point, Johnson simply shows that he doesn't understand how science works, a complaint that I am very used to hearing, I assure you. And specifically, he says, Johnson has no feeling for the problems that any scientific theory has in accounting for what we observe. There never was a time when the calculations based on Newton's theory of gravitation or any other theory were in perfect agreement with all observations. In the writings of today's paleontologists and evolutionary biologists, we can recognize the same state of affairs that is familiar to us in physics. In using the naturalistic theory of evolution, biologists are working with an overwhelmingly successful theory, but one that is not yet finished with its work of explication. It seems to me to be a profoundly important discovery that we can get very far in explaining the world without invoking divine intervention and in biology, as well as in the physical sciences. Now that is to say that the refutation of my claim that the Darwinian theory is strongly against the evidence, when the evidence is considered objectively and without a bias in favor of the theory, is to say lots of scientific theories have problems, but look at how successful we are. Why, for example, look at how successful the Darwinian theory has been. Um, the, the theory itself is one of the great accomplishments of science, which he cites to show how successful it is and therefore how wrong the critic must be. 
Now, the reason for this is because the Darwinian evolutionary biology is part of a vast scientific reductionist program to which Weinberg's own work belongs. This is what I 